All right, welcome back. So we covered chapter 12 and Paul kind of introduces us to this idea that there's not just one spirit at play. We have the Holy Spirit who is from God, who does the things of God and teaches us the things of God and leads us into it. We also have human spirit that's still involved. And sometimes we kind of, you know, follow in our own human desires and want to elevate that up. But also then there is the other, you know, the evil spirit or what you'd call demonic spirits. And so he says, now concerning the spirituals, I don't want you to be uninformed about these things. And so he kind of spoke about this, this thing as it speaks about spiritual gift, uh, the fact that, you know, not everyone have the same kind of spiritual gift, but also that, you know, it's God who apportions the gift that believers have. And so he apportions according to his will, which gift we're going to have and when and, and how it's going to be done and used. And he says it's supposed to be for the building of the, of the body of Christ, right? So he says, just like the human body has many members, but each of them have different roles they play, but each of them must function if the body is going to be okay. So it's, it says, so it is with the body of Christ. There are many members and each of these members have been given a different gift and a different role, and it must function. Each of these members in the body of Christ must play their role. Even the one quote in quote we would consider is the least in the body of Christ, it says it must be used. Fine. And so kind of ended chapter 12 with these questions, are all apostles? And the answer to that is no, not everyone is, is an apostle uh, you know, or was. Are all prophets? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all... And, and so his emphasis there is not, even though you know, each of these are very important roles and important gifts and causes God has given, yet we see that he's not called everyone to doing the same thing. We see that he's not gifted everyone with the same kind of gift. Why? Because every gift that God has a portion to believe as a, through his spirit and according to his will is important and it must be used. And so that means, like mentioned in, in our earlier lesson in chapter 12, that there's no gift that is better than the other. Each gift given by God is, is important and it must be used. And when used well, it is used for the glory of God, not for the benefit of the man or woman who possesses it, not for the, the glory and the good and the fame of the one who has it and is using it, but for the good of the other members who form the body, but ultimately for the glory of the one who gave the gift, glory of God himself. But then he concluded that chapter by giving, you know, an advice. He says, now I want you to, Ad admire, desire is the word, desire even a higher gift, desire a higher gift, the, the higher gifts, what's this gift that it talks about, when of course then he says, now I will show you a still more excellent way, it says there's a gift that all of us need to desire to have, and then he says, now let me show you the excellent way to this gift, and then we come into verse 13, now, I mean, chapter 13. Now, remember, like we already covered in chapter 12, what was happening is, you know, the, the believers in Corinth had put so much value in the gift of tongues to the point that the rest of the spiritual gifts was neglected. The rest of the functions and the things that needed to be done in the church was neglected. And everyone was just about speaking in tongues and, you know, that manifestation and experience, quote unquote, that came with it. And like I mentioned already, even when we're doing the survey, you know, the general survey of this book, we discovered that, you know, there were a lot of sins and problems in this church. There was division, there was immorality, you know, there was idolatry, there was, you know, uh, issues in, 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 you know, there was immorality and just weird things and people are fighting and, and not talking. And then, and now those, these issues at times, why were, were there things like 
complete blatant sin, immorality that even the pagan world could not allow a man having his father's wife in the church. He entered in the church and nothing is done about it. The, the church was so divided, not, people are not talking about factions, that there was this issue of the idolatry and you know, all of those things. Why? If they were so spiritual, if they were so godly, and if, you know, the manifestations, quote unquote, that they had in the spirit was from God. Well, because they, unfortunately, because they prized the gift of tongues above everything else, they incorporated the pagan worship. That's why Paul addressed it in chapter 12 that we already covered. So he says, now I want to show you even a higher, a higher gift. What is this higher gift? What's a more excellent way? Chapter 13, verse one. If, now notice this, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now notice this carefully. It says, if I do, if I speak in the tongues. So one, we just set this straight. One, Paul is not saying that he spoke in terms of men and of angels. No, no, he's saying if he did. Now, remember, he said, I want to show you a more noble, a more excellent way. Remember the advice is now you should desire even a higher gift. Desire a higher gift. Which one is that? We don't know. Then he says, now, but now let me show you a more excellent way. How, what is that gift that is higher that everyone should have? He has just told us that not everyone can have the same gift. But now he's saying everyone should desire this. Why? Because there's something that everyone who is in Christ must possess. And says, let me show you. And, and so to show the more excellent way and prove to his readers what this higher gift is and why it is important that everyone must have he says now he's going to begin making a point and making a case and literally proving a point here and so he uses a hypothetical statement so he says if i speak in the language of man and of angels but i don't have love i'm so useless even that ability would still be useless. So you see, many people say, well, I am speaking in this tongue. It's not, it's not of men. No one understands because it's tongues of angels. Well, you see, uh, even Paul spoke in tongues of angels. Paul did not. And certainly, of course, they use this verse to say Paul did. But look at what he says. Paul did not say, I speak in tongues of angels and of, of men. But it says, if I speak, but I don't have love. That speaking, that ability of even speaking angelic language would still be useless if I don't have love. Why? Because it is through love and because of love that we are who we are today. If it was not for love, we would still be dead and lost in our sins and trespasses, deserving death and awaiting death and eternal separation. If it was not for that, we would probably not even exist. Because, you know, for a fact that when God created earth, God did not create earth and everything in it, including us. No, God did not create heaven and earth because he needed us. God does not need us to be God. And, and, and again, that is where we make mistakes in our proclamation. We keep saying this. God needs you to be this. God needs you to be that. God needs you to be. No, God doesn't need us. We need him. You see, there's a difference between a need and a want. God wants us to worship him. He doesn't need us to worship him. God wants us to believe in him. He doesn't need us to believe in him. You see, when you need something, a need is something you cannot do without. And if that need is taken away, your existence stops. 
for example, that, that's why, you know, food and, 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 and shelter and medical care is, is considered the basic need, a human basic need. Why? Because if you take away food, he will die. That would, that would be the end of that person. You take away medical care, you know, they're gonna fall sick and die. Right? But a want is something that you know you can have, but it's it's not what defines you, it is not what makes you to be who you are, it's not what makes you to be alive and continue existing. For example, having a car. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with a car, right? But if, if you didn't have a car, not having a car would not make you stop existing. You'd still be alive. You'd still be existing and be there, even though you don't have a car. But if food is taken away from you, you can only stay for so long and you'll be dead. If medical facility is taken away from you, medical care is taken away from you, you can try and, and, and survive sickness just for as long as possible, but you'll die. You, you see, when, when it comes to God, God doesn't need us. It's not like if we don't believe in him, God will stop existing. Or when, if we don't worship him, God will stop existing. You see, to say God needs us, that's what, that would be the implication that without us, God will stop existing. See, a need is more like a source of your life for you. Taken away, you're gone. Does God want us to worship him? Yes. But would God still be God even if we did not worship him? Yes. Does God want us to believe in him? Yes. But would God still be God even if we did not believe in him? Yes. That's why Jesus said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, if you read the, in the gospel account, as Jesus is journeying to Jerusalem, what we know as the triumphal entry, the Pharisees, out of jealousy, tells Jesus, teacher, command your people to stop worshiping, literally, to stop worshiping, to stop singing. They are, quote, unquote, making noise. What did Jesus say to them? Jesus said, truly I tell you, if they stopped worshiping, the creation will worship me. You see, God will still be God even without us. But if you take God away from the picture, then we stop existing. We need God. God is a basic need of human beings. And if you take God away, we will stop existing not just in the now, but even in eternity. That is very important for us. And God is love. That's why Paul says, this is an excellent way. And he says that this is the high gift we should all desire, that we have love just like our Father has. Because love, like the scripture says, covers a multitude of sin. He continues. So did Paul speak in, in tongues of angels? No, he didn't. At least it's not recordable. This verse doesn't, this verse doesn't say he did. We need to make sure we read in context. So in verse 2, it says, And if I have prophetic powers, and I understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have no love, I am nothing. You notice he's bringing this, this quote-unquote big things that we prize so much. The speaking in tongues and different tongue languages, you know, having prophetic powers so we can make things happen. We can, you know, understand mysteries. We can interpret dreams and all of that. He says, oh, if I do, I'm able to do all of those and I don't have love. He says, it's still useless. Why does it say that you're still nothing? Because it is not possible that you are in Christ and God is actually at work in you and through you and you don't have love because God is love and they who believe in him walks in it because love has transformed them. And so he's saying there's no way one they are speaking in tongues, which we've already been told is a spiritual gift and have hatred in their heart. 
There's no way they can have prophetic powers. Of course, we've seen again, that's one of the, the gifts. And be and have hatred in their heart. Or, or have all of these abilities and have hatred. Why? You cannot have God and hatred in the same place. You cannot have the Holy Spirit and hatred with your sin. You cannot have holiness and sinfulness in the same place. So it says, oh, that is nothing. And again, you notice this, and if I did. Well, why is it just using the hypothetical statement? Because one is not what was happening in Paul's life. But is using it to prove a point. Paul was a real loving guy, very sacrificial man. In verse three, he says, and if I give away, again, you notice he brings this hypothetical. Again, he says, if I did, not saying he was doing it. If I did give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have no love, I get nothing. If and if everything, and now again, it brings here this very important. So you notice what he's saying. Love is very important because it's at the core of human existence, and it should be the motivation. So he says, even giving everything you have to others to the point that you even give your life, give yourself to be burnt for their sake. It says, if it is not done out of love and love is not in the picture, it says, you gain nothing. Giving everything will cost, you know, benefit you nothing. Even dying will benefit you nothing. Love is very important. Then it says, and then he begins defining love that this love is talking about. Now, as you read, you notice he's defining agape love, the God's kind of love, the sacrificial, the unconditional kind of love that God has given to us. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not at arrogant. Now, I, I want you to take time as, as I'm reading these qualities, these things about love, I want you to notice that, you know, how it cuts to the heart, but also just how in your own life and maybe the life of other ministers that you know, or at least have encountered, will probably possess or claim to possess these Spiritual gifts, prophetic powers, ability to speak in tongues and do this and do that and do that. And then you notice how the life is. So he says, love is patient. Are they patient? Love is kind. Are these people kind? Love does not envy. It does not boast. Meaning it is not prideful. But we say pride. Is, has failed the hearts of many who, quote in quote, possesses this kind of gifts, especially the ones who have prophetic powers, the ones who can perform miracles, the ones who speak in tongues, the ones who have, you know, can interpret mysteries and mysterious things. They're so boastful and prideful, and they make sure you know they are there in your midst. He says, that is not from God. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable and resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. The love of God does not rejoice at wrongdoing. But what do we see today? We see these mighty men and mighty women who supposedly are used of God and they have the gift of God, the gift of healing, of prophecy, of prophetic powers, of mysteries and speaking tongues and all of that. What are they doing? They're condoning, saying they're actually encouraging it. They're twisting God's word and making it okay for people to live in sin. They're twisting God's word and making it okay for them to rob from people. They're twisting God. And so literally they are okay wrongdoing. You know, saying God's love does not do that. It does not rejoice or condone wrongdoing or evil doing or evil deeds. And if this person is the, if, if this minister is actually laid by God and being used by the Spirit of God, then it's going to be revealed in their response to sinfulness and the evil around them. 
It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It rejoices with the truth. Verse 7 says, love bears all things. Now, just before bearing all things, it says, to love, the love of God rejoices in, in the truth. And it's the same love, the same spirit that is given this gift, right? The truth of God's word that defines the gift and how it is used. It says it rejoices in it. That means if the truth is gift and this gift is from the Holy Spirit, one, the way the gift is used, how it's going to be used, and why it's going to be used is going to be in line with the truth of God's word. And it's going to rejoice. This person, this minister will be more joyful, will be more excited and be more okay hearing the word of God, the truth of God preach and share it and leave not just him, but even with having fellow ministers and other ministers who are teaching the truth. Do not be offended by the truth. Do not be offended when you ask them about the truth. Do not be offended when you speak the truth to them or near them. The one from God rejoices in the truth. But seven says, love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things and love endures all things. It bears all things. It believes all things. Now, what are those, those all things? Now, remember, it's just talking about the truth. Bears all things. Connected to the truth. It believes all things that is found in the truth. It hopes all things that is declared in the truth. And it can do us all things that is declared in the truth. Love never ends. Why is it that love does not end? Because God is love, and this love is sourced in him. And because God is eternal, because God lives forever and ever he will be, that's why love will not end. Because love can only end if God had an end. Love could only end if God was going to end. And because God is not going to end, he's forever going to be. Love will always be there. And he says, but as for prophecies, which many people kind of, Prides about. They will pass away. There'll be a time where one, there's no need for prediction. One, two, there's no need to preach the word of God when we are face to face with God Himself. No one will need to teach you the word of God and show you the things of God. God Himself will be in our midst. And so there'll be no need for pastors and teachers and prophets or even apostles, right? As for tongues, they will cease. Even give up tongues, speaking, but you speak in different languages, says that will cease. As for knowledge, it'll also pass away. There'll be no need for it. For like, like it says, for we will know him as he is known, for we'll see him as he is. Know him as he is. There'll be no need to be taught to know something. We will see him as he is. Nothing will be hidden. Right now, with, with veil and filled eyes, we see as dimly as it's in a mirror. And then when it uses that word, a mirror, now many of us fail to comprehend that because we're comparing and thinking in terms of the kind of mirrors we have today, which is like, it's like a 3D mirror, you know, like a full HD, very clear. Back then, the mirror they had were just polished metals. Metal that has been polished very well, that you can barely see yourself. That's the kind of mirror they had. And so when it says right now, that when it comes to the things of God and, and knowing God, it says we see him as, as dimly as we see ourselves in a mirror, because at this time, the mirror they had is just polished metal. You want to understand that you, you try to get a metal and try to at least polish it, do the best you can, and then try to use that as a mirror. That's what they had. Where it says, Tongues will also pass away. They will cease. Knowledge will do the same. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the prophet comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, 
I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. That's time when the prophet comes, when the Lord returns, and we're face to face with him. That's what he's saying. I sure know fully, even as I have fully been known. I shall know him fully, like he fully knows me now. That's what he's saying. And then he finishes in verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love are some good things he told us. But the greatest is love. He says now faith and hope. Faith, hope, and love abide, but this, this three, but the greatest of these is love. Now remember, said I want to show you a higher gift. What is it that every believer should desire to have and earnestly pray and seek and cry and study and yield and learn and, and, and build in themselves? It is love and God's kind of love. That's the one, that one, love. Not, not the kind of things we, we, we make, we're making fuss about. Love. All this abides, but the greatest of it is love. Because there'll be a time where faith will cease. There'll be a time where we'll not need to believe and, and wait. We have faith, we will see him. How about when we, we're now with him? We will still need faith to see him. We have faith we will pass on from this life to eternity. How about when we pass on from this life to eternity? Will we still need it? No. How about hope? We hope to be in a new heaven and new earth. How about one weather? Where's the hope? No. But love, why is it the greatest? Because it will always be there. As long as God exists, love will be there. And always love will be there. That's why it's very, very important. We are going to, later on or another time, just get time to study, get back to chapter 14, as we now dig deeper into Paul's explanation of tongues and prophecies. And hopefully what, what we covered in chapter 12 and now covered in this chapter 13 about love, you know, Paul is showing us a, a greater, higher gift has helped you and, and you've learned and you've seen something from it and about it. And now that we, you know, when we get to chapter 14, we will just be making references to what we've covered in chapter 12 and chapter 13 as we dig deeper into prophecies and terms. Look at what terms are, what differences are there and, and compare it with the kind that we see today and have today and see what the word of God says about it. We need to rejoice in the truth and make sure it is God's word. You guys, if it is not God's word, I mean, God has not said it. If that's not match with what God has said, it, then it is not true. If it contradicts what God has revealed in his word, does not matter we're saying it. God will never reveal something right now that contradicts what he already revealed. Because God doesn't change. He doesn't change his mind. doesn't change his principles. doesn't, doesn't change his method. God's ways and God's word is the same. It's true. And you can trust them. Well, God bless you guys. And um, thank you for watching and thank you for following. Uh, we pray that you, God continues growing you in his word. And do that as you're growing, you not only live for him, but that you help other people know the truth and help other people live for him as well. God bless you.